Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another session of our summer sirah series, Walking with the Prophet Sallallahu uh, This Today, inshallah, we'll be having our seventh session, uh, in which we'll be talking about the worship of the Prophet Sallallahu So as a reminder, as we've been walking along the Prophet Sallallahu in various ways and uh, fashions and observing the Prophet Sallallahu sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu Last time we looked at the speech of the Prophet Sallallahu and having a conversation with him and his humor and the manner of speaking. Today we examine the Prophet Sallallahu worship and not just in prayer, but in other rituals and matters of faith as well. So uh, inshallah, as we mentioned, uh, let's picture ourselves as we did last time. We uh, pictured ourselves having this conversation, this one-on-one -on -one with the Prophet Sallallahu and now we are able to observe him and being able to worship with him and, and being able to see not only how he worships, but how our experience might be with him as well. So, uh, of course, before all things in beginning, we begin with the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. And we begin by sending salawat and sending praise upon his blessed prophet, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the family uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu and those pious predecessors that walked alongside him. Uh, may Allah be pleased with them all. So to begin, inshallah, today with respect to the worship of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Mughira ibn Sharba narrated that Allah's Messenger performed the ritual prayer, the Salah, so long until his feet became swollen. So he was asked, must you burden yourself with this when Allah has already forgiven you your former and your latter sins? And he replied, shall I not be a thankful servant? Uh, it's a very well-known tradition, but uh, kind of gives a little bit of an intimate insight uh, that this was, uh, I believe, a, in the commentary, a conversation between him uh, and Aisha, um, who you know sees him praying, but also you know, see him praying that long that his feet have become swollen and, you know, asking him this, that despite, you know, you know who you are, we know who you are and the revelation that you receive and the stature that you have, that despite all this, you know, are you still going to burden yourself? Are you still going to do this? And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responding humbly that shall I not be a thankful servant? I think that this speaks volumes because again, we see that we live in a, in, in a day and age and maybe for some time in a world where uh, individuals who are religious leaders or claim to be religious leaders live a double life that uh, outside to the public, they are, you know, one, uh, you know, at one, one completely different individual. And, and, and they may be, uh, you know, amongst the most foremost in how they look in their piety and their actions and everything uh, and very noble. And then when they're behind closed doors, they become complete monsters and they become uh, the exact opposite of that. And uh, to see in this case how the Prophet uh, was very consistent in his life, but he also uh, was even more so in his private life that uh, whatever he had done and does in the public sphere, he would he would do even more in his home life when he, he takes it upon himself. So he never kind of gave himself that kind of lap of uh, fell into the lap of luxury in, in a sense that says like, you know what, I am a prophet, I'm just going to take it easy. No, he he felt that as he felt his faith and his uh, spirituality and his religion to be a cause for even more action and in and, and, and building that connection with Allah. Al-Aswad ibn Yazid also narrates again a lot of these come from uh from Aisha and uh you know these uh, intimate kind of uh, narrations that come about in terms of what was the, the worship of the Prophet like as many of the people would see him in the masjid and and whatnot but behind closed doors what was that what was that prayer like and so uh Al Aswad ibn Yazid uh, says that I asked Aisha about the nighttime prayer of the Prophet and so she said he used to sleep at the beginning of the night then he would get up, and when it was time before the daybreak, he performed the witr prayer, which is a ritual prayer with the uh, odd number of units. So, um, you know, just uh, what, what's performed after the Isha prayer. And uh, then he came to his mattress, and uh, if at that time he uh, had a need, or if he, uh, you know, he, he he felt the need, he would uh, have relations with his wife, uh, with his wife. And when he heard the call to prayer, he would come up. And if he was in a state of major ritual impurity, he would pour water over himself and do the ritual bath. And if not, 
he performed the minor ritual evolution and went out to the ritual prayer. And I feel like what this uh, this narration shows us, in a sense, was that the Prophet was, you know, was a human being. Was a was a was a man. Was a human being. Was someone as Aisha had described in a separate narration. Was he was a man amongst men. He was he was an ordinary man. Um, that he was he was one, you know, amongst the people. But he stood out in in a, in this aspect. But this shows, in a sense, that the Prophet was someone that uh, would be dutiful to his religious obligations but he would not do that at the expense of uh he would he would also not do that at the expense of just um what his obligations as a husband would be or um as a uh a, a, as as a partner in a in his relationship that he he would uh, also be someone that would be present to the needs of his wife would be someone that was present to his own biological needs would be someone that would be present um for the marital needs but he would also be present for his ritual worship needs and so uh we see this balance that is that is uh, present in the prophet life and that's something that you know we we try to aspire for as well because oftentimes we may get feeling really really spiritual in one way and so we do that but we neglect our family or we get really involved with our family but we might neglect you know the uh things that are due to our religion and our faith so this just kind of helps see the process of was uh in a state of balance there ibn abbas narrates that uh he relates that i uh he spent a night in the home of his maternal aunt uh maymuna who was also the wife of the Prophet and uh, Ibn Abbas says that I reclined across the cushion uh, in the Prophet's home, and uh, the Prophet reclined length lengthwise. And whereupon then uh, the Prophet slept until the middle of the night, or a little while before or after it. Uh, Allah's Messenger, the Prophet then woke up, wiped the sleep off his face, and recited the final ten verses of Surah Al Imran. Then he approached a suspended water skin, performed the minor ritual ablution performed it well, and after which he performed the ritual prayer. Ibn Abbas then continued that, I got up and I stood by his side, uh, whereupon the Prophet Sallallahu placed his right hand on my head, gripped my right ear, twisted a little bit, and brings me to the right side. Uh, and after this, he performed two cycles of ritual prayer, then two more cycles, and then two more cycles, and two more cycles, and two more cycles, and then two more cycles. When I say cycles, you have units or raka. So two raka, two raka, two raka, um, which it was, it was a total of 12 raka. Um, and then the narrator uh, relates that, um, you know, uh, he's uh, six times after which he performed then a odd number cycle. So the witter prayer that comes there. And then he recl reclined until the muadhan came, whereupon he got up and performed two abbreviated cycles or two units, um, which are the, the units before Fajr that the Prophet would, would perform in his home and then do the Fajr Salah in the masjid. And then he went out and performed the Fajr prayer. So looking at this in the sense, you see the, the again, um, in Ibn Abbas, again, an intimate detail. It's within the home of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but you get to see an idea of how much the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam worshipped. This was a part and parcel of his being. Uh, it wasn't just preaching. It wasn't just proselytizing. Uh, it wasn't just outward. It was very much inward. It was very much uh, what he was doing as well on the inside. And uh, what's also very interesting here is oftentimes you might read it and see like, oh, you know, it was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being harsh with his, uh, with his nephew here um, by, you know, moving Moving him here, but we see that uh, Ibn Abbas had lined up to the side of the Prophet. So when it was just them two praying, um, and you know you're you're to be on the on the right side of, of the one reciting with uh, uh, doing leading the prayer of the Imam, uh, and so the Prophet so some, you know brings him over uh, to the right side and corrects there. But you also see that uh, the Prophet so as we talked about when he was with Anas ibn Malik, that uh, he never said oof. He never hit any children. He never said anything to cause pain or harm. Um, so this you can think of as like the relation of an uncle to the nephew, that if you're teaching someone a lesson that in that time, um, that this was something that if you want them to really understand that lesson, that this was something that the process of wasn't doing for every single person, but this is something that uh, the process of would impart upon uh, his, his, his nephew who would become, you know, a scholar uh, of, of great heights and 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 renown in his own regard, um, but to bring him over to that side uh, and to give him that lasting impression that you do it once, you touch your hand on that stove, not, it won't ever happen again. Um, that the process then brings him to the side and and teaches him that lesson, but. Uh, in that, he narrates then how the Prophet was worshiping, how much he would worship uh, in that space. Um, and, and then 
to not just fulfill his personal obligations, but also the communal ones. Ibn Abbas also uh, builds off of this, that the Prophet would perform the 13 rak'ah or 13 cycles of ritual prayer during the night. Uh, Aisha relates that if the Prophet ﷺ did not perform the ritual prayer during the night because sleep had prevented him or his eyes had been too weary, then during the daytime he would perform twelve cycles of rich or during uh, he would perform twelve cycles or twelve units of ritual prayer during the daytime. Again, this is a just shows that consistency that the Prophet ﷺ had that he, as much as he knew that he was assured. Uh, or if he did not know it in the sense that as 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 much as it was generally understood that the Prophet ﷺ, being who the Prophet ﷺ was, would be someone who's hereafter would essentially be assured, who's somebody who would be um, at the forefront of, uh, of, of the Akhirah and would be somebody uh, that would not necessarily have to worry about their fate uh, because of his stature, because of who he was. Despite that, despite that assurance, despite all of these things, the Prophet ﷺ still went above and beyond to make sure that even if he missed something, that he made sure he made it up. That it, it speaks volumes. That you know you could have something where it's it, these are these are more optional prayers in the sense, and the process of uh, is it you know sees that he he may have missed them um whereas anybody could have been like okay hey you know we'll just do it next time or in that arrogance that can come up and say like well you know i'm i'm you know i'm 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 you know chosen by god why you know i don't need to necessarily worry about that and the process some doesn't see it like that the process some doesn't have a shred of arrogance to where he takes it easy on himself in that aspect and the process some rather uh, sees this as a call for opportunity and the Prophet ﷺ sees this as an obligation and continues to pray and continues to do so and uh, does so, um, you know, in, in the daytime or whenever he is able to do so. Uh, Abu Hurairah relates that the Prophet ﷺ said that if one of you gets up during the night, uh, let them begin their ritual prayer with the uh, two, two brief, uh, you know, cycles or two brief rakah. Uh, that if you're going to observe the uh, night prayer and, you know, just uh, in, in, in that sense, uh, to do so uh, with with uh, a, a, a moderate, you know, start. And so, you know, don't don't start yourself and exhaust yourself on the first two raka. Um, do something that that will help you kind of get the motor running and, and something that uh, will, will help you get started. Another uh, Sahabi related that... Um, you know, I, I I was determined to contemplate the ritual prayer of the Prophet Sallallahu intently. Uh, so I laid my head on his doorstep um, or the at the entrance of his tent, and Allah's messenger then performed two brisk cycles of ritual prayer. And after this, he performed two long, long, long cycles. I narrated it like that to emphasize it. Um, so he's at four rakah. He then performed two cycles that were shorter than the two before them, six. And then he performed two cycles that were shorter than the two that were before them, eight. And then he performed two cycles that were shorter than the two before them, 10. And then he performed two cycles that were shorter before the two that were before them, 12. And then finally, he performed a single number cycle, which added up to a thir total of 13 cycles. And so Aisha was asked, how was the ritual prayer of uh, Allah's messenger uh, during Ramadan? And so, you know, we, we, we see actually, let me let me just back up a little bit, but you kind of see as well here that uh, the companions of the Prophet and we've talked about the the odd number of units that the Prophet would perform, the 13 units that he would do at night. Um, but we see as well that the uh, how the companions would be um, very curious about, you know, what does the Prophet do at night? Like, you know, what is the Prophet what is that ritual prayer like? And, you know, for them uh, to, to go to these lengths, to be able to wanting to observe. But you see how the Prophet ﷺ was very uh, diligent in his uh, in his prayer. And the, the observations that are then made are, are seen that there, there's kind of a method to this, that he's um, that he, he's performing them diligently, but he's performing these consistently because we see these same narrations from different narrators and different spaces. And so uh, it's it's helpful to kind of see that this wasn't just a one off thing. This was something the process did by habit. Uh, Aisha was asked that how was the ritual prayer of uh, Allah's messenger during Ramadan? And so she said that neither in Ramadan nor in any other month would Allah's messenger add to the total of 11 cycles of uh, ritual prayer. He would perform four uh, and she would say, don't ask about their excellence or their length because of just uh, she, you know, not to uh, to 
you know, ruin any kind of description or to sully any kind of description of uh, their beauty. And then he would perform four. Um, do not ask about their excellence or their length, as she said. And then he would perform three. And Aisha said that, um, that I said, oh, messenger of Allah, do you sleep before you perform the odd numbered ritual prayer? And he said, oh, Aisha, my eyes may sleep, but my heart does not sleep. And so we, we see in this aspect as well that he has the 11 units and then does uh, uh, he, he does the, the he, he has the other cycles for it for the winter prayer as well. Um, but it's just very fascinating to, to, to see in this aspect um, that Aisha says that, uh, you know, our art. Do you, like, you know, apart from just asking like a technical question that before you do the winter prayer, do you do you sleep? And I, and his response is just so beautiful where he says that, why should my eyes may sleep, but my heart does not sleep? Uh, that, 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 you know, in a sense that I might be sleeping here, but my, my heart is still, you know, pumping. My heart is still running, not, not just from a biological sense, but from a sense of uh, spirituality that I might be sleeping, but the, the worship continues in my heart, that, the, that, that element of connection to Allah, the remembrance of Allah is something that continues. And we know the Prophet ﷺ narrated that uh, everything has a polish and the polish of the heart is remembrance of Allah. And we know the Prophet ﷺ's heart was pure, was, was, was crystal clear. And uh, to just imagine this, this connection here of how worship, how salah, how remembrance of Allah, what's at the root of prayer, what's at the root of uh, dua, what's at the root of that connection, uh, could create that and see how the Prophet felt that this, this energy within, within his own heart there. And Aisha then relates that uh, Allah's Messenger, building off this last uh, Hadith, uh, the Aisha's, uh, Aisha relayed that Allah's Messenger used to perform 11 units of prayer during the night, making one of them odd numbered. Uh, and when he had finished, he would recline on his right side. Aisha also narrated that Allah's Messenger used to perform nine cycles or nine units of ritual prayer during the night. So you see that uh, some of the numbers sometimes vary from 13, 11, 9. Um, and as we know uh, in, in this space that it is uh, any kind of number of odd number of prayers for uh, the the winter prayer that that is done, but you see the Prophet some would do a number of uh, the optional nawafil prayer, the the prayers before um, to to build up to that. So two cycles of prayers, um, and you see the Prophet some does uh, you know a number of those before uh, performing the winter prayer. Uh, Hudayfa ibn al Yaman performed the ritual prayer with the Prophet some during the night, and he said. That when he entered into the ritual prayer, um, he, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah is supremely great, Allah Akbar, in the, uh, the Lord of power, sovereignty, magnificence, and sublimity. And then he recited Surah Al Baqarah. Then he bowed down, and he bowed down for approximately as long as he had stood erect, saying, Glory be to my Lord, the Almighty. Glory be to my Lord, the Almighty. And then he raised his head, and he stood erect for approximately as long as he had bowed, saying, To my Lord belongs the praise. To my Lord belongs the praise. And then he prostrated himself, and he prostrated himself as long as he had stood erect, saying, Glory to my Lord, the Most High. Glory be to my Lord, the Most High. And then he raised his head, and the pause between the two prostrations was approximately as long as the prostrations. During uh, the two prostration, between the two prostrations, I'm sorry, during the pause, he said, My Lord, forgive me, my Lord, forgive me, until he recited the uh, Surah Al Baqarah, uh, and the Surah Al, Al Imran, Surah Al Nisa, and Surah Al Maida, and or Surah Al Naam. And according to Abu Isa, um, that uh, sorry, this is a separate thing here, but uh, you, you kind of get an idea here with respect to um, you know which which surahs were were being recited. But you see the process, um, regardless of what was being recited, regardless of what is being said here, you know we, we get a lot. We get how we do the salah, um, regardless of what religious community within Islam we are part of, uh, come from the tra the traditions, the ahadith, and the interpretations of them um, there thereon, but. Uh, what we kind of get from this as well is you kind of see how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what, what we can really take away from this is regardless of the surah that was recited, regardless of what is here, you see that his uh, his standing is as long as his bowing. His bowing is as long as uh, his prostration. His prostration is as long as his standing. That everything is very consistent, very measured, but it's filled with a 
uh, this this connection to Allah. It's, it's filled with this remembrance of Allah that he begins the prayer with uh, with sending uh, a a praise and declaring the uh, the the greatness of Allah, and he goes bows down, declaring the praise to Allah. He goes into prostration, declaring that praise of Allah, and he comes back up uh, in, in in between prostration, asking Allah to forgive him and imparting this upon. But you see that how the Prophet um, we see oftentimes in our time when we might have a, a quick meeting to do, and then we have maybe a window of 10 to 5 minutes to do our, our Salah, we might go in and we might just try and pray as fast as we can. But you see the Prophet was really, this was an intimate conversation for the Prophet This was a, a divine encounter uh, as, as Salah was. And so the Prophet really immersed himself in it and 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 you can see it in in how long he stays prostrated you know after a while you feel like you might get dizzy um or after a while you feel like you might get tired but the process of being in that space intentionally knowing where he is who he's in front of what the scene is uh and and, and being present to that so uh being being mindful of our prayers is, is something that that oftentimes as cliche as it sounds is something that uh how the process of at least stood there that not only are we mindful of ourselves, but mindful of to whom we are praying. Aisha relates that Allah's Messenger spent one whole night reciting uh, a single verse from the Quran. And the commentary of this says that the ayah is that last ayah of Surah Maida, um, chapter five, in which uh, it's translated that if thou, if you punish them, Allah, if you punish them, lo, they are your servants and slaves. And if you forgive them, uh and and if you forgive them uh low and they are uh they are your uh, your slaves uh low you only you are mighty and wise and so you see as well the prophet some didn't was not just reciting for the sake of you know just 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 saying you know like i'm i'm just going to do all these different things the prophet some sometimes would receive a heavy revelation would receive a heavy um, portion of the quran or would have a uh, contemplation or uh, you know sitting with a specific verse of the quran and you see how the prophet some for a whole night is reciting this because how it's weighing on him and but also apart from how it's weighing on him his sincerity in connecting he knows what it means he knows what he's asking for he's he's lifting up with respect to um you know his his own community so he has uh, this this aspect and again this was uh, i believe verse 118 of surah maida but you see how the prophet is not just praying for himself the prophet is praying for the other people the prophet is praying for his community and continues 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 in this aspect and uh, it shows that sincerity of it that oftentimes we feel like we might get bored if we just keep reciting it but you see the process in, in this aspect knew what he was reciting he knew what he was asking allah he knew what he was communicating and he kept reciting that uh, that one verse uh, abdullah ibn masood relates that i performed the ritual prayer one night with the prophet and he remained standing until i almost did something bad uh, he was asked uh, abdullah ibn masood was asked what did you almost do and he replied, I nearly sat down and left the Prophet Sallallahu standing by himself. And so this, this just shows the humanity of uh, the companions, of those companions that are at the for foremost of our, um, not just our praise, but um, of our reverence. And we see how, in this case, Abdullah bin Masood was a close companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu knew um, that this was someone very sincere in their faith. He wasn't just you know, testing him beyond his measure or anything, but the Prophet was praying and was there and so long and standing that uh, Abdullah ibn Masood, you know, obviously probably got tired and was was like, you know what, I I, I think I'm gonna just sit down. But uh, he 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 didn't you know do this do so. Uh, he stayed standing, but he he said that you know I I I I was having that inclination that I almost did something bad. And I almost sat down, but you know, I see the prophet standing, and he continues to stand. But it just shows the humanity that that it wasn't just all rank and file, without uh, any kind of struggle or whatnot. That faith was a struggle for for folks, and and to 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 kind of hang with the prophet at at, at the level that the prophet was doing was also uh, a, a struggle. But there was that humanity that we felt that aspect, and you see with Abdullah and Masood, 
having that, that he was like, I, you know, I don't know if I felt, I felt a little bit uh, guilty. I felt that I almost did something bad and I nearly sat down and, and it was permissible to, to sit down if, if you're, if you're unable to stand, but he, he, he didn't want the Prophet Sallallahu to be alone in that aspect. But you see um, how, how the honesty is that the faith is a struggle and, and to, uh, to, to try and do as much as we can, but also to, to, to not just kind of see that, Hey, we're, we're completely without, um, without any imperfection that, uh, beyond the process of them, that all of us, you know, will struggle in our faith and in, in the way that we try to achieve that we will struggle in some way, shape or form. I even as close as we were to the process of, uh, Aisha relates that the process of used to perform the ritual prayer of sitting down. Um, and this was related uh, that the commentary is this was later in his life um, that he would he would perform the ritual prayer sitting down. And so he would recite the Quran while he was seated. If the amount of recitation, uh, if the amount of recitation remaining was 30 or 40 verses, he would rise and recite standing up and then he would bow and prostrate. And then he would do likewise in the second cycle. And there was a late, another narration that by the time the Prophet Sallallahu had passed, he was performing most of his ritual prayers from a sitting position. So seeing that, you know, we, we that the prayer in Islam has that accommodation, it, it doesn't require the that everyone must be able bodied and have to be standing and whatnot. The Islam and the worship of Islam meets you where you are. If you are even in, in you know bedridden if you are someone who uh is, is 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 in a hospital situation or you're paralyzed or whatnot the obligation upon you is not to try and do your best to stand up or whatnot that as you are able to to your best of your ability perform the salah sometimes we might be paralyzed almost from the neck down we might be paralyzed from so many other places sometimes it may just be eye movements sometimes it may just be that thought sometimes it may just be that space but sometimes uh in many other common spaces where we aren't able to bend where we aren't able to walk especially if we're more elderly or if we've had some procedure done that that uh that measure is given that you that islam meets you where you are that you don't need to you know try and be uh someone who you're not that that you can worship allah sitting standing laying down uh as you are able to uh but that also doesn't mean that you take advantage of that as well that the process of in this case was only sitting down because he was just not able to get up that his, his at this point his health had reached that level where he just did not have that strength to be able to get up uh and to perform it as he as he would normally before them and so for us it doesn't mean that oh there's a chair you know i'm an able-bodied person i'm just gonna go sit down and do it no if you're able to this is there's there's a blessing in that there's the increased blessing of being able to do it there but also if you're not able to the accommodation is there as well uh abdullah ibn shaqiq said that uh, i said i asked aisha about the voluntary ritual prayer of the prophet Islam, and she said he used to spend a long night performing the ritual prayer standing uh while standing up and a long night while sitting. And so if he recited the Quran while standing, he would bow and prostrate from a sitting uh, from a standing position. And if he recited while sitting, he would bow and prostrate from a sitting position. And, I, and, and uh, Abdullah building off of that says, I asked Aisha about the ritual prayer of the Prophet Sallallahu And she said he used to perform two cycles of ritual prayer before the noon prayer, two cycles of uh, ritual prayer after it, two after the sunset prayer, two after the evening prayer, and two before the, the dawn prayer. So you see this conversation uh, with Abdullah ibn Shaki asking, asking Aisha uh, about not just the the voluntary prayers of the Prophet in, in the night, in that sense where she's talking as we did in the previous uh, hadith with respect to how he was sitting when he if he had to sit or if he was standing if he had to sit but then goes and asks about the nawafil prayer asks about the additional prayer which we'll also get into uh here shortly hafsa the wife of the prophet and the daughter of umar al-khattab narrates that uh, allah's messenger used to perform voluntary ritual prayer sitting down and he would recite a surah and pronounce it slowly so slowly that it would seem to be longer than one that was actually longer to it. Again, Prophet was not rushing through his prayers. Prophet was someone who was intentionally sitting with the uh, the the chapters that were there, the revelation that was there, and reciting it. And we see in so many different narrations that he would recite in a way that you could tell letter by letter what what is there, and uh, that this. But he would he would do this specifically, conscientiously of the people around him. We know that this is a messenger this is a person 
who when he heard the cry of a child, he would quicken and hasten and shorten his prayer. But we know that this is also someone who would lengthen his prayer for the sake of a child that would come and sit on his back or would, would be there for him. So the Prophet would be someone that would be mindful of his worship, not just in his own context, so he only goes into a zone and nobody is, is uh, you know, any of any relevance to him. But the Prophet was cognizant and conscious and mindful in his space, but he was also mindful of the needs of the people around him. So many of these narrations are also uh, with respect to when he when he recites, this is his recitation, how he would uh, recite it, but also being mindful that he wouldn't just, you know, not be, uh, he'd be ignorant of the people behind him or the needs of the folks behind him, he would do it. But this is also a lesson as well, how would we recite? We don't want to rush our salah. Oftentimes we do it where we jump in and, you know, like a Japanese bullet train, we would just go back and forth through our surahs. But uh, we, we we see the Prophet someone's really sitting with it, was, was doing to where everybody behind him could understand what he's saying. Ibn Omar relates that I performed two cycles of ritual prayer with Allah's Messenger uh, before the noon prayer. And this is kind of going to the Nawafil prayer, the optional prayer. So two cycles of ritual prayer uh, before the noon prayer, two cycles after it, two cycles after the uh, sunset prayer in his house, and two cycles after the evening prayer in his house. And so, uh, again, when we say cycles or units, say rakah. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, the rakah of the prayer that are being performed, so two rakah. Uh, in one aspect, to Raqqa here and there. And so Ibn Umar also said that Hafsa, his sister Hafsa, uh, also told me, or was the wife of the Prophet, also told me about the two units of prayer, of the early morning prayer that were done before Fajr. But I did not see them performed by the Prophet. And this was because the Prophet uh, related that he would perform his ritual prayers, his, his, uh, his voluntary sunnah prayers of Fajr in his home, and then he would perform the um, the, the he, would, he would perform with the congregation the Fajr Salah uh, in the mosque. Another companion narrates that we asked Ali, uh, the cousin and the son-in-law of the Prophet ﷺ, about the ritual prayer of the uh, of, of the Prophet ﷺ in the daytime, and he said you would be Ali responded that you would you you know you wouldn't be able to bear that you'd be incapable of that, and so we responded that any one of us who is capable of that we will perform it. And then Ali said that when the sun was over here and he points eastward, like its appearance from over here pointing westward uh, at the time of the afternoon prayer, uh, that he used to perform two cycles of prayer. So he talks about the Salat al Doha. Um, and when the uh, sun was over here, like its appearance from over there at the time of the midday prayer, he would perform four, uh, referring to four rakah. And he would also perform four rakah before the midday prayer and then two after it and four before the afternoon or asr prayer and uh, separating each prayer of cycles with the salutation of peace uh, among, upon the angels drawn near and upon the prophets and the believers and the Muslims who follow them. And so we, we see this mention of the, the Salat al-Duha. And so just to clarify, the Salat al-Duha is the forenoon prayer. It's a voluntary prayer that uh, which time begins when the sun is as as related, you know, has risen to the length of a spear above the horizon. So, you know, just above the horizon, it ends when the sun goes to its zenith or right before uh, the Hor time. And so the minimum uh, for the forenoon prayer, the, the, the Doha prayer is uh, two units and the maximum is 12 units so, or 12 rakah. So you see the Prophet is mentioned of the Salat al Doha that um, you know, the Prophet is performing. Uh, and what's being related here is the optional prayers uh, in addition to the ritual prayers that are also being performed here. And so uh, Aisha relates that, uh, or sorry, um, Aisha was asked, that did the Prophet Sallallahu perform the mid-morning ritual prayer, the Salat al duha And uh, she said that, yes, he performed four units, four rakah, and he used to add whatever Allah wished. Um, and uh, Abdullah ibn Shaqiq also asked, uh, what was the Prophet Sallallahu used to performing the mid-morning ritual prayer? And she said, no, except when he was coming back from an absence. So seeing that uh, this this wasn't maybe an every single day thing, but again, there's different narrations that are there. But uh, that he he would he would perform it, but th that uh, it may not have been you know on the uh, it, it would not have been in a sense that it was 
established exactly like the routine of the the other five daily prayers that sometimes it would happen sometimes it wouldn't and there'll be another narration that kind of builds on this uh anas ibn malik relates again the prophet used to perform the mid-morning prayer uh doha prayer in six cycles we see any, anywhere from two units to 12 units so six units there uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Layla says that I've never heard anyone mention seeing the Prophet Sallallahu performing the mid-morning ritual prayer except Umm Hane. And she related that Allah's Messenger entered her house on the day of the conquest of Mecca or the Fatah Mecca, uh, whereupon he performed the major ritual ablution, glorified Allah in eight cycles. And I've never seen him, the Prophet Sallallahu perform a ritual prayer in a more abbreviated form than that, even though he completed the bowing, the ruku, and the prostration and the sujood. So he was he did it, he did it quick, but he was doing the uh, salat al duha in, in that space. Uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri relates that the Prophet would perform the mid-morning ritual prayer so often that we would say he doesn't admit it that, or omit it, that he, he it, it's something that's there, and he would omit it so often that we would say he doesn't perform it. So you see that similarly there's a, a parallel relation with uh, narration with respect to fasting um, and, and how uh, Aisha would relate uh, about a certain practice of the Prophet and how he would um, fast, like, you know, so much so that he doesn't omit it, and then he would fast. Uh, he would stop fasting for a certain time outside of Ramadan. That we say he doesn't. He doesn't perform it in that space. And uh, Abu Ayyub Al Ansari says that the Prophet Sallam used to devote himself to four cycles of prayer at the high noon. So I said, O Messenger of Allah, you devote yourself to these four units at high noon. And he explained, the gates of heaven are opened at the high noon, um, or uh, at the at this uh, Luhur time at Doha time uh, that when they are unlocked uh, until the midday ritual prayer is performed so I love to have a good deed ascend on my behalf during that time I said is there a Quranic recitation in each of these four cycles um, and the Prophet said yes and I said do they contain a separating salutation of peace and he said no so all four um, just at once there uh, Abu Abdullah ibn Sa'id uh, relates that Allah's Messenger used to perform four cycles of the ritual prayer after the sun had passed its zenith before the noon prayer, before the horse so of the Doha prayer. And he said, it is a time in which the gates of heaven are open. So I love to have a righteous deed ascend for me. Then again, thinking about the Prophet feels like he has as much uh, to gain from his actions and faith as much as anybody else that it's it's the the obligation is not lifted for him uh, as much as it is for anybody else or, or that it's not upon him as much um but it is even more so he felt upon him than anyone else uh, Ali relates said he used to perform four cycles of ritual prayer before the noon um, prayer and he mentioned that Allah's messenger used to perform them at the time of uh, the sun's zenith passing and he used to prolong them uh, now, with respect to uh, optional prayers as well, the nawafil prayers, uh, there's a narration that I asked the uh, Abdullah bin Sa'ad narrates that I asked Allah's Messenger about performing the ritual prayer in my home and performing it in the mosque. And he said, You may notice how near my home is to the mosque. I prefer praying at home over praying in the mosque, except in the case of prescribed ritual prayer. The Prophet would, um, the, the optional prayers, especially the Fajr prayer, perform it at home, the night prayer after Isha perform them at home but he would prefer praying at praying at home uh, in, over praying in the mosque except in the case of the prescribed ritual prayer so seeing that uh, there's a balance that the process of would uh, not just keep his worship for the mosque and just the home life is in the home that he would have uh, uh, an overlap and he would love to to have his worship as part of his home life there with respect to worship, we also know that in, in worship, uh, in Islam, it's not just limited to salah. It's not just li limited to the prayer. It's also inclusive of the fasting, of the charity, and so on and so forth. And just for the sake of time, we'll dive a little bit here into the fasting of the Prophet Sallallahu which we talked about uh, before. And uh, we're going to just go through a few traditions here, inshallah. And so in the past, we've talked about some of the fasting of the Prophet Sallallahu And so... Uh, we will just uh, share some quick hadith here, inshallah. And so uh, Abdullah ibn Shaqiq, again, asking Aisha a lot of questions about the Prophet but of benefit because they come back to us here. And so uh, asking Aisha that uh, of um, you know about the fasting of the Prophet And so she said that Prophet used to fast until we would say he has fasted. And he used to break fast until we would say he has broken his fast. 
And she also said that Allah's messenger did not fast for a whole month after arriving in Medina with the exception of Ramadan. And Ibn Abbas builds on this saying that the Prophet ﷺ used to fast until we would say he doesn't intend to break his fast during the month. And he used to fast, uh, he used to break his fast until we would say he does not intend to fast during it. And he did not fast for a whole month after arriving in Medina with the exception of Ramadan. Uh, Humayd ibn Malik relates that he used to fast during the month uh, until we would assume that he did not intend to break the fast during it, and he used to break the fast until we would assume that he did not intend to uh, fast during any of it. You would not wish to assume that he was performing the ritual prayer during the night unless you saw him performing the ritual prayer, nor that he was sleeping unless you saw him sleeping. So the process of being so intentional in these spaces, but also, uh, he, you know, pe people would kind of be left a little bit guessing that, you know, is it, how is, it, is he doing this? Like, how far is he going along? Um, like, I guess he's not going to eat. He's not going to break his fast or he is breaking his fast or he's performing the ritual prayer. But you see how the process almost really, it just says how he was all in on this. He wasn't just kind of like, you know, hanging around all the food spots or anything like that. He was he was all in uh, to where people would not be sure. Like, is he is he going to eat again? Like, you know, what's what's happening here? Uh, Umay Salama relates that I did not see the Prophet Sallallahu fast for two consecutive months other than Sha'ban and Ramadan. And the commentary that follows is that uh, it's not necessarily for the full month of Sha'ban, but for most of the month. And Aisha also adds that I didn't see Allah's Messenger fast in any month more than the fasting for Allah's sake outside of Ramadan in Sha'ban. He used to fast through all, but a little of Sha'ban. No, indeed, he used to keep fast through all of it. And again, the commentary is that uh, not necessarily the whole month of uh, Sha'ban, but uh, for primarily most of it, that he would be fasting in that month in preparation for Ramadan and the blessings that Sha'ban has. Uh, Abdullah ibn Masood related that Allah's Messenger used to fast three days at the beginning of every month, and he would seldom break his fast on Friday or Yom al Jumar. Uh, Aisha relates that the Prophet would, uh, was devoutly committed to fasting every Monday and Thursday. Uh, Abu Huraira also lifts up that in connection to this, the Prophet said, deeds are presented to Allah on Monday and Thursday. So I would like to, uh, my work to be reviewed while I am fasting. I would like my deeds to be reviewed while I am fasting. Uh, so this intentionality, this presence, but also a routine. The Prophet had a routine uh, with respect to his worship that uh, Aisha also relates that the Prophet used to fast on the Saturday of one month, the Sunday of another month, or in the Monday, as well as on a Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday of another month. So kind of showing that it's permissible to fast on all these different days uh, as well. So so giving that, that, that flexibility as well with respect to the fasting. Um, it was also related that uh, Aisha was asked, was Allah's messenger used, used to fasting three days out of every month? And she said, yes. And I asked, which days did he fast? And she said he wasn't concerned about the days he would fast. You just make sure he was fasting. So uh, again, you don't have to get into such a strict thing that we have to do it like this, like this, if it's especially with its optional uh, voluntary worship, but seeing how the process was just building consistency. Again, the best deeds are those that are done moderately, but consistently three days out of every month, just making sure he's fasting three days. It didn't matter which one it was. Uh, Aisha relates, we just passed Ashura, actually, um, that Ashura was the day on which uh, the Quraysh used to fast in the pagan era, in Jahiliya, and the Prophet ﷺ used to keep it as well. Hence, when he arrived in Medina, he kept the fast and commanded its observance. And then when Ramadan was decreed, uh, the fast of Ramadan became obligatory religious duty and Ashura was omitted. So one is free to fast this day or not fast. It. And of course, we know the heaviness of Ashura for uh, our Shia siblings and community that uh, this is a, a very heavy day, especially for the whole Muslim uh, Ummah as well. It should be um, with respect to the martyrdom uh, of the uh, grandson of the Prophet Sallam, Imam Hussein, uh, and, and the, the many family members and, and descendants of the Prophet and their companions. And so uh, Ashura is a very heavy day, but it's not just one which we oftentimes hear is just a day of fasting. It's just of these days. We see the Prophet you know, got to a point to where when Ramadan came, he also left the fasting of Ashura, but people were free to fast it or not fast it. And so um, knowing the nuance is also important in this space. But again, uh, seeing how the Prophet would, uh, would, would be someone of consistency.
Aisha was also asked. Aisha was also asked a lot of questions. So uh, this this gives Aisha uh, a lot of uh, credit here for for some insight uh, to the Prophet Sam's deeds, uh, but uh, or the worship of the Prophet Sam. But was Allah's messenger used to singling out any of the days for fasting? And she was she responded that Prophet Sam's deeds were perpetual; they were continuous. Who among you would be capable of doing what the Prophet used to be able to do? Uh, but just seeing that he would be continuous, he wouldn't just do, you know, one of these specific things. He would be very continuous. That so much so it would be hard to kind of isolate it, but he would just, he would just, he would be fasting. Not that he would always fast on every single thing like this, but he would just be continuous. He got to a habit to where it was Mondays and Thursdays that he would at least do it, but he would fast other times as well. Um Aisha also relates that Allah's messenger entered in my presence and there was a woman with me who said, and so he said, who's this? And I said that, oh, this is so-and-so. She doesn't sleep at night, you know, due to worship that she's always up. And Allah's messenger then said, uh, incumbent upon you are the works of which you are capable of. For by Allah, Allah does not cease rewarding you until you become bored. Uh, and the work near, dearest to Allah's, or the deeds dearest to Allah's messenger, the Prophet was that which was done consistently. So, uh, you know, with respect to, you, you you don't have to, you know, go into overdrive or kill yourself over trying to do uh, this worship, just do as, as much as you can, um, uh, as, as much as you are present to them. Um, because after that, uh, it may, it may go into something that you're not necessarily used to in that space. Uh, Abu Saleh relates that I asked Aisha and Umm Salama, which work was dearest to the Prophet They said that which is most consistent, even if it's small, uh, with respect to the recitation of the Prophet we've talked about how the Prophet recitation was that which was explained uh, letter by letter, which was you could hear the voice of the Prophet dragged out uh, over long vowels. Uh, Umm Salama relates that the Prophet when he would recite his Quranic uh, recitation in, in Salah as well, that he would say, uh, in Surah Fatiha, that Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, praise be to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. And he would pause and he would say, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. He would pause, all merciful, all compassionate. And then he would say, Master of the Day of Judgment, uh, Maliki O Middin. And you see this, this intentionality, but also he's, he's not in a rush. He's not rushing his recitation here. Um, Abdullah ibn Qais narrated that I asked Aisha about the Quranic recitation of, of the Prophet Was he used to whispering the recitation or pronouncing it audibly? And she said he used to do both. Sometimes he would whisper, sometimes he would speak audibly. I therefore said, praise be to Allah who has granted us flexibility in the matter. Again, that there's flexibility that is going in both ways. Uh, Umehane related that I used to hear the Quranic recitation of the Prophet while I was, uh, and during the night while I was, uh, you know, on my bed sleeping. And uh, you see as well that uh, there's this consistency in this, re this recitation. Um, you see that Ibn Abbas relates that uh, the Quranic recitation of the Prophet was sometimes heard by those in the chamber and while he was in the house. And the last thing we'll just cover here is, uh, is very subtle, but we see that the Prophet's prayer and his worship, whether they're fasting, whether the prayer, anything like that, was not absent of emotion. Um, we see that it was narrated that I came to Allah's messenger while he was performing the ritual prayer and his inner body was pr producing a humming sound like the humming of a cauldron due to his weeping. He would weep and he'd be very uh, emotional in his prayers as well at times. And Allah's messenger uh, had told another companion, please recite the uh, to Abdullah bin Masood to recite the Quran to me. And he said, O oh Allah's Messenger, shall I recite the Quran? Well, it was to you who it was revealed. See the adab that, that they have. And he said that I like to hear it from someone other than myself. So I recited Surah An Nisa until the verse that read, And we bring you as a witness against the uh, O Muhammad, them, that, that implied that this was, we bring you as a witness against these. And then I saw the eyes of the Prophet, uh, the eyes of the Prophet bathed in tears. And we see uh, that there is the, these, this emotion that's there um, with respect to the Prophet's, uh, you know, worship that, that is in, intense. There's also a narration that comes with respect to the, the eclipse that Abdullah ibn Omar relates, um, but we'll, we'll save that for another time. Uh, we had talked about the modest, the modesty and humility of the Prophet uh, with respect to his worship. That when he performed Hajj and he performed the pilgrimage on a shabby, uh, shabby camel saddle that was just worth a few coins, and um, you know he uh, made a he, he 
proclaim that, oh Allah, make it a pilgrimage devoid of hypocritical ostentation and no notoriety. Um, and that, you know, when he, uh, when, when Aisha was asked, how was the mattress of the Prophet Sallallahu it consisted of tanned hides with fibers, it was rough, and uh, that it was coarse, and we folded it in uh, we folded it up for him to sleep a little bit more comfortably. And then one night, um, you know, we, we after we had folded it, that uh, he woke up the next morning and said, what did you spread out for me tonight? Um, they said, oh, uh, it's your mattress, except that we folded it out four times. And so he said, and we said it would be softer for you. And he said, restore it to its original condition for the softness prevented me from performing my ritual prayer tonight. So you see how the process of worship for the process of was not just something that uh, was an obligation. It was something that uh, or it was not just something that was a ritual. It was something that was a means of connection. It was an obligation. It was something that the Prophet ﷺ looked forward to and felt a duty to and responsibility to. But also the Prophet ﷺ austerity, the Prophet ﷺ piety, humility with all these things should be lifted up in that worship. And the emotion that came, that the emotion, that worship should not be devoid of emotion, whether it's charity, whether it's prayer, whether it's fasting, you are fully present there. And what we take away, inshallah, as we close out, is the Prophet ﷺ was fully present in these spaces. He knew what he was saying. He was mindful of Allah, but also he had a healthy fear in this aspect that um, I need to be doing this. Like, you know, I, I this is this is incumbent upon me. So if this was the Prophet ﷺ and, and the amount of prayer that he was doing and why he felt the need to pray despite his stature, what, what about us in this space? So we conclude here. Inshallah, we have one more session uh, left with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's sirah, the walking with the sirah, and we'll look at the grief and the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inshallah. A uh, heavy topic next week, but we'll see you all next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.